name is Gabriela Columbus Pata, uh, District 1 City Councilor, the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Government Operations. Today is June 14, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcasted on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. Attendance in accordance with Chapter 2 of Acts of 2021, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meeting in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. The City Council will be conducting this hearing remotely. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. If you are interested in testifying, please email our central staff liaison, Ron Cobb at ron.cobb at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket 0471, an ordinance, an amendment to the Boston Municipal Code in regard to measuring racial equity and affordable housing. The matter was sponsored by Councilors Fernand Tanya Fernandez Anderson, Brian Morell, and Rootsy Louis Jen, and referred to the committee on March 6, 2024. Today, I am joined by my colleagues in order of arrival. Uh, the lead sponsor, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flynn, and Councillor Weber. I'll pass it over to the lead sponsor for any opening remarks that she may have. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, everyone, for being here. Um, and to my co-sponsors, um, the Color of Wealth study, uh, which found that the average net worth of a Black family um, in Boston is $8, is now about nine years old and outdated. The council accepted a grant um, expenditure to update that study earlier this week uh, because we know that it is important to measuring equity in economic development. Um, just some facts that we have, we know that the home ownership rate in Boston is lower than the national rate with black ownership rates at about 30%, um, Hispanic and Latino residents at 30, 17%. Um, and white residents at 44%. In Boston, black mortgage applicants are three times more likely, um, and Latino, uh, Hispanic and Latino are twice as likely to be denied a mortgage than white applicants, while they are 2.5 um, times more likely to be denied mortgage for property in the predominantly black neighborhoods such as Roxbury, Mattapan, compared to um, our white neighbors. It is incumbent upon Boston to measure how developments in affordable housing have assisted black and brown residents um, who are less likely to own uh, their homes, more likely to live in poverty, and most affected by rampant gentrification and increasing housing costs making them um, the most logical beneficiaries of affordable housing in Boston. This ordinance calls for the creation of a report uh, which will go into detail on a number of important issues related to affordable housing, um, including demographics data of who applies for affordable housing opportunities, who receives those opportunities, how long they have to wait to receive those opportunities and how successful these opportunities have been in place, uh, in placing people into homes for um, a long, the, the long term. Uh, the burden of producing such a report is hopefully low, um, but the impacts are significant. Uh, during, during this hearing, uh, you will hear from members of the administration, in addition to the numbers of housing advocates who can attest to the value of high quality metrics being used to measure, um, to measure access to affordable housing. I look forward to the conversation and I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Chief Dillon, for always being um, such a wonderful um, partner um, in our city to doing this work. Um, and again, uh, Madam Chair, thank you and look forward to the conversations. 
Thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I just want to flag for central staff that Councillor uh, Council President Ruzi Louisjean is in the waiting room and has been here for quite a bit. If we can uh, let her in, seeing as she's another lead co sponsor, we'll have her go and then go to uh, Councillor Quinn, Councillor Weber, and then we've also been joined by Councillor Julia Mejia. Ethan, can you confirm that uh, Council President Louisian is going to be promoted to panelist? I'm not seeing her in there right now, Madam Chair. Okay, um, let's get that figured out. Uh, and while that, while we do that, uh, Councillor Flynn, if you have any opening remarks, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I listened closely to Council Fernandez Anderson. I'm looking forward to learning more about tools and how we can address this critical issue outlined by Council Fernandez Anderson. I also want to acknowledge um, Sheila Dillon and her team for their work across the city in helping people in need um, access housing. So um, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Uh, Councilor Weber. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to thank uh, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson for, for bringing this along with Councillors Farrell and uh, Madam President Louis Jen. Uh, I look forward to learning, you know, what, what sort of data we should be focusing on and, um, you know, how we can, uh, you know, help this process and, and what we're going to do when we get the, the data. Thank you. Great. Uh, Councillor Mejia. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, don't worry, it's not COVID. I just have allergies. <laughs> But I'm happy to be here with you all uh, this morning. And I, I do believe, since I've been on the council, I've been talking about dashboards and metrics and data. And I think that the more information we have, the better we can be informed in the decisions that we make. So I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation and, and being a thought partner alongside you all. And I want to thank the makers for bringing this to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Are we confirmed that we have Council President Hui Shen? Not yet, Madam Chair. Okay, Council President Luigian, if you can hear us, we will go into Dr. Nina Estrella Luna's uh, testimony and then we'll circle back to you. Um, I want to be able to do Dr. Estrella Luna justice, so I'm going to get her uh, title up. First and foremost, she's a East Boston resident and my neighbor, and really happy to have her here. Uh, but she's the research lead for Homes for Equity. Uh, Dr. Estrella Yuna, this is uh, your time. I, I, I believe we talked about 10 to 15 minutes, um, but please go ahead and the floor is yours. All right, thank you everyone. And uh, just to confirm, you all can hear me? Everyone can hear me? There we go. Okay, sorry, I didn't see everybody. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee today about uh, docket 0471 specifically. Uh, so I am Dr. Nina Estrella Luna. I'm the owner of Star Luna Consulting, which is an anti-racism and social equity research education and policy firm. Uh, one of the things that we do includes what we call uh, accountability studies, which is research that is aimed at either documenting the root causes of social vulnerability and specifically racial inequities, or identifying mechanisms, specifically policy and practice mechanisms, by which vulnerability and disparities can be reduced. Uh, as was mentioned, my firm completed a more than year long study looking at historic and ongoing racial discrimination in the home buying market, specifically in the city of Boston. Uh, the study was done in support of the Homes for Equity initiative, which is a restorative home ownership pilot project focusing on addressing the racial home ownership gap and associated racial wealth gaps in, in Roxbury specifically. We produced a total of four reports through the study, and I'm happy to share a link with you uh, to those reports for your review. As part of this project, we documented many things. Um, we obviously documented the racial disparities in home ownership in Boston from the mid 20th century through 2021. Uh, and importantly, for our purposes, we also documented the various ways in which the city of Boston and other actors created the current racial disparities in home ownership. Uh, it suffices to say for the moment that those racial disparities are stark and that the city of Boston contributed to those disparities both actively and passively. 
the city has quite a bit to atone for, and this proposed ordinance, I, I believe, is one small step in that direction. So in my short time with you today, um, I'd like to focus on the kinds of metrics to consider as you monitor the city's efforts to meet their commitments and legal obligations to affirmatively further fair housing. So to start, it's important to get a baseline understanding of what equity is and why it's important to focus on equity rather than equality. Uh, so what we know from research and from lived experience is that equality actually does not produce equity. Equality in treatment or equality in opportunity does not actually reduce racial disparities in particular or any disparities between social groups in the ways or at the speed with which we would like to believe. And this is because historic discrimination on the basis of race or other characteristics ripples across generations. So when black and brown families pay higher interest rates on mortgages than white families are paying, something that we found happened in Boston historically and is continuing to happen today, that means that there is less money available in black and brown families to attend to their daily needs or to save for the future. Lower interest rates provides white families with more money to invest or to save, which means that their children and their grandchildren have greater access to wealth building opportunities like buying a home, going to college, starting a business than black or brown families do. And we estimated the economic impacts of paying higher interest rates across two generations. And it amounts to somewhere between $31,000 using very conservative economic methods, saving in just a regular savings account, to $250,000 using standard economic methods investing in the stock market. And that's two generations, meaning that a, what the wealth that a grandparent does not have to pass down to their grandchildren. So even if I could snap my fingers now, and make every single black and brown person treated exactly the same as white people are treated as a whole. If they were given the same exact opportunities, the exact same quality education, the exact same air and water quality, the exact same access to healthcare, the exact same housing and job security, anyone alive today is living the legacy of the constraints and the privileges that our parents, our grandparents, and our great grandparents were either forced into or were provided. So the proposed ordinance focus on equity is exactly right, because this is what will help the city of Boston identify and then dismantle those systems and structures and policies and practices that maintain racial disparities in Boston. So based on the research that we've done for HFE that is very specific to Boston, as well as my experience as an equity researcher, I would recommend a few things. Uh, in terms of metrics, I would recommend adding a few measures to the list of characteristics to be disaggregated as seen in section 101.2.3. Uh, the one that I strongly recommend is a metric that looks at the intersection of race and income together. And let me tell you why. One of the longstanding tropes and forms of resistance to addressing racial disparities, both politically but also legally, is the argument that these disparities, like housing disparities, for example, aren't rooted in race, they're rooted in economic differences or economic issues. Now, if this were true, one of the things that we should see is that, for example, the denial of mortgage applications should be more strongly related to income rather than race, right? Because your risk of default should be more related to your income, not your race. However, that is not what we found. Instead, we found racial disparities in mortgage denial rates within every single income group. So what does this mean? It means that low-income black and brown mortgage applicants were more likely to be denied their mortgage application than low-income white applicants. And the same is true at moderate income, middle income, and high income levels. But more importantly, we found that high-income black applicants were more than 32% more likely to have their mortgage application denied than low-income white applicants. In this fantasy world where only income matters, we should not see that, but in fact we do, which tells us 
that the racial disparities and mortgage denials that exist here in Boston is about race, it's not about income. And why is this important to look at is because uh, the, the looking at this intersection of race and income is because to legally justify better targeted policy around housing specifically, and there's a legal structure around this, you need to demonstrate that in Boston, race matters more than income. And you're only able to do that when you measure that intersection. I would say it's equally important to look at the intersection of race and ethnicity. Uh, one of the things that we looked at uh, in the mortgage data was the experience of Afro-Latinx mortgage applicants specifically. We found that Afro-Latinx applicants experienced worse outcomes, meaning higher denial rates and higher interest rates than either Latinos or Blacks as a whole. Now, the sample for that was smaller than we'd like, but it is consistent with research, uh, other research in other areas of social life, showing that Afro-Latinx individuals and families live with poor health, lower educational attainment, less job security, et cetera, when compared to either Black or Latinx folks as a whole. So I think it's worth the effort to bring those two characteristics together so that you can better design and better justify your policy solutions. Similarly, I must recommend that Asian subgroups also be disaggregated. The experiences of Vietnamese folks, for example, are very different than the experiences of South Asian and East Asian folks. So it's worth monitoring those potential disparities, again, so that you're targeting and justifying policy solutions appropriately. And this is where I might need the grace of 30 more seconds. Um, one last thing that I need to also recommend in relation to the data collection around affordable homeownership programs. So it is fantastic that the city of Boston has affordable homeownership programs for Boston residents. 100% support of that. However, those opportunities come at the cost of deed restrictions that can constrain the amount of equity that those homeowners are, are, are able to accrue. What this does in the impact of that is it reduces the wealth that that family can accrue over time, or at least over the time in which they own that property. So I would also encourage you to consider adding the estimates of equity available to homeowners in deed restricted homes, and of course, disaggregating that in the, ver the various ways that the ordinance already, the proposed ordinance already proposes, and the ones that I recommend here. And, uh, and Sheila, I'm gonna acknowledge that this is not gonna be easy. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be your office that's tasked with doing this and that you might actually need more time because one of the things that I've also learned from the folks at Homes for Equity is that there's not a standard deed restriction on equity accumulation in our affordable home programs. Uh, as I understand it, there's like dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of different formulas in the deed restrictions on equity. But I do think it's worth taking the time to do and to do well because what we don't know is whether or not there are racial or other disparities in who gets to accumulate how much equity through those affordable home ownership programs. And this is particularly important given the increase in the cap on equity accumulation for future affordable home purchases that, as I understand it at least, doesn't apply to past affordable home purchases. So I'm at time, I assume. Um, so if you have questions about the specific kinds of statistics that you would, might wanna consider including as at least a floor in the ordinance, I'm happy to uh, take those questions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning um, and please ask me a question. Thank you, Dr. Estrada Luna. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna defer to the lead code sponsor, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would you like to have individual questions uh, for her, or would you like to go to the administration and then open it up for questions? Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for the uh, consideration. I think that this is going to be a pretty uh, straightforward conversation. Uh, I think most of us here agree. I don't want to speak ahead of time. Um, so I think we should go to Chief and then to the question so that the two can be combined. Very well, awesome. So let's go to Chief uh, Sheila Dillon. Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Estrella Luna. That was, you know, very, very, very helpful. And I'd, I'd like to know even more, and I, I certainly respect the work that Homes for Equity has been doing and the issues they've been bringing forward. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and uh, all the city councilors that are here today to really talk about this issue. Um, 
we know uh, all too well that there are, are real racial disparities in housing access and outcomes in Boston. And collecting the right data uh, is not only the right thing to do, but it is very, very helpful to agencies that are given resources um, di from different sources to know whether or not we are spending the resources in impactful ways. Um, I'm, I don't want to be repetitive, so I won't, but oh, I'll try not to be. But um, just to illustrate, I was reading about it last night and this morning, it is, there is impl race implications in, in every type of housing program, uh, in the rental market, in the, what we're seeing in evictions, what we're seeing in home ownership that was talked about by both the city councilor and the good doctor. And we, we know this, you know, we know this to be true. And not only looking back on who's being impacted, but also looking forward, especially as prices continue to increase. Uh, rents right now, and it's even hard for me to say this, are over $3,000 a month. Um, so we know, there's we, we, know that, uh, we know that it's getting harder for Boston at large to afford rents, um, but certainly uh, it's harder for black households and Latinx households and on top of the, the disparities in, in income, it's all, we also know that there's a lot of discrimination when households go to rent. So it's getting very, very, very difficult to, to rent new, and, and new opportunities. Um, who's rent burdened in the city? 66,000 low income rent burdened, there's 66,000 low income rent burdened households in Boston and over 72% of that cohort is BIPOC compared to 28% of white households. I won't repeat uh, Councillor Anderson's uh, comments on home ownership rates. Uh, they are they are indeed uh, not reflective of the city's population, and we've been working extremely hard uh, to make it easier for households of color to buy in the market. But with it, uh, sales prices now at seven hundred sixty five thousand um, dollars and getting and getting higher many of our Boston families, especially BIPOC families, are getting priced out. So we know, the, we know the statistics, they are troubling. We think about them every single day. And I think to really understand, like I opened with, whether or not our programs and our resources are having the impact that, that they should, and whether or not a lot of the state organizations, a lot of the nonprofits, a lot of the banking industry, whether their efforts are having the impact, we need to look at the data. Um, we do collect a lot of data on our programs, um, the intersections of who's getting our money, uh, whether or not they're able to use our money in ways that have the, the, the results they want, were they able to buy a home, stay in their home. Um, so that I feel pretty good about a lot of the data we're collecting, but as the order has stated, um, we are not collecting right now uh, really good, robust data. And, and my colleague, who uh, Karina Oliver Milchman, who's director of policy and research, will, will tell us why and what we're doing to correct that on who's in our lotteries, who's accessing affordable housing units, um, which has really been a missing piece. So I would welcome the discipline of um, of collecting data and making these available every you know every single year, maybe more often, but really working with the city council to figure out what we should be collecting and making public as we continue to do this work. I I always think there's no way of defining what we should be spending our money on without using data, and there's very little way there's there's very few ways we can really tell whether our investments are being you know doing getting the outcomes that we want them to get unless we're looking at at the data. So. You have my, certainly my partnership on this project. I am excited to get going and work with you. But I do want to hand it over to Karina very briefly so she can tell you a little bit more specifically about what we do collect and what we're working on, uh, what we're doing to correct the gaps. Thank you, Chief Dillon, and thank you to Madam Chair and counselors for raising these important questions and inviting us to share information. There, there's a lot to say on this topic, and so I will try to be as succinct as possible. Um, the, report, the report requested by the council will help us and the public to understand to what degree we're addressing the gaps that um, so many on this um, 
on this Zoom today spoke about, MOH does already track a lot of information pertaining to who our programs, policies, and other resources serve. So I wanna highlight that so we're starting from the same place. Um, we currently track the location and type of our affordable housing. We track applicants to affordable housing lotteries on a project by project basis, a unit by unit basis. We track that by race and ethnicity, gender, Boston residency, and a couple other factors. We also track buyers of our income restricted units, both um, MOH units and IDP units. We track that by race and ethnicity, household size and income. We track financial assistance provided to home buyers, um, as well as the location of those units and the sales prices and financial assistance provided to senior homeowners by race, ethnicity and income. And we track renters who receive support through our rental relief now tenant stability fund by location, race, ethnicity, income, and household size. So that's all data that we feel is quite solid. The quality is high. Um, it is collected in a format that allows for rigorous analysis. Going forward in response to your order, we're readily able to track the time residents stay in our affordable housing for select programs, including um, One Plus Boston, our first time home buyer program, and a couple of others mentioned in the hearing order. Um, we're not sure if this data is available for city programs that aren't run by MOH. It's something we would need to look into, and I know a couple of those were highlighted in the order. Um, we're also able to track the number of new renters in Boston and the number of new homeowners um, with some caveats in terms of, um, you know, homeowners, for example, it would be a sample because the data we have is exclusive of cash buyers, uh, for example. Um, and some of this can be analyzed by factors like age, race, ethnicity, gender, household size, income, and so forth, but not all due to um, some of the limitations of census data and HMDA data that we'd be using. Unfortunately, it's not currently possible to report out on applications, waiting time, and accepted applicants. Every project's data is in multiple individual spreadsheets right now, and there are also data quality concerns, and I'll speak to that a little bit more. Um, we also can't report out on applicants assigned preferences for similar reasons, um, and I'm not sure if the BHA has data for federal housing programs by neighborhood of residence, which was mentioned in the order. We'd have to look into that. We also don't have, nor can we access data on query requests made to the state by race. So while we do capture applicant demographic information on a project by project basis, as I mentioned, this information is currently stored across many separate sources that are hard to connect and combine with one another. It's not currently captured in a way that allows for rigorous analysis of an applicant's experience by age, race, gender, household income, household size, household income, and neighborhood of residence. And that's for two reasons. One, until recently, different city agencies were responsible for different parts of this application and lease up process and changes to integrate existing data systems are still underway. Second, most of the process from touring a unit to applying for the unit and verifying eligibility is conducted by a network of third party agents who don't use a city system as their primary tool to manage this lease up process. So for these reasons, a retroactive analysis would require significant staff time investment Get, which it would be incredibly difficult, um, and it likely would yield incomplete results due to the current data collection methods. So our recommendation going forward is to first and foremost focus on improving the application experiences of our housing seekers and partner agencies, will, which will allow us to collect the requested data in a manner and format that permits permits analysis and regular reporting to the council and the public. And we see this as a larger effort that's a continuation of important work we've already begun. And I'd like to share just a little bit about the work we've been doing on this topic. So last summer, we surveyed hundreds of recent housing lottery entrants and hired a professional research firm to conduct focus groups and in-depth interviews with housing seekers and leasing agents. And we found through this process that there were barriers and opacity in our existing processes. And then this past fall, we embarked on a review of policies and processes that support the marketing application and lottery of our affordable housing units. And this led us to streamline and add transparency to the application process and simplify the way marketing plans are submitted and approved. And we then considered all our income restricted housing application and monitoring functions within MOH. 
We consolidated them by bringing on several staff from the BPDA and creating a new division dedicated to this purpose. We also launched a similar review of the policies and processes given governing how we calculate household eligibility for these units. And this resulted in standardizing how eligibility calculations are done. We clarified how we treat different kinds of assets and income and improve the workflows between city staff and agent partners. So while much of the work that's been done in the last year to improve how we staff administer these processes and implement policies that guide the application experience, there's still a lot to do to improve the digital experience of our housing seekers and in relation to that, how we structure our data capture in a way that lends itself to robust reporting. And we see this as an opportunity to provide the information you seek as part of larger changes we're considering around how we interact with housing seekers and leasing agents and the systems we use to share information and manage our work. And these larger efforts are going to take time, city investment, and new partnerships with outside technology vendors. So I'll, the last thing I'll say is to help determine exactly what that looks like. We've begun a process this summer of analyzing the diversity preservation preference pilot, which ran from August to December of 2017. And that analysis will include what projects the preference was applied to, where, and who benefited by different demographic features. And it's gonna serve as a pilot for our staff to better understand how to improve tracking applications and occupancy of income restricted housing and how preferences are applied, which I think are the key questions here um, in the order. So I'll leave it at that and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karina, and thank you to Chief uh, as well for your uh, presentation. I will pass it over to my colleagues now for any questions they may have, starting with the lead sponsor, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, can we promote uh, Mark Martinez? Uh, Attorney Martinez is in the waiting room and he's a part of the panel. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Ethan, do you see Attorney Martinez? Yes, sorry, I'm bringing him in now, Madam Chair. Okay, Thank you. And could we allow him just five minutes uh, to wrap up the panelists and then, um, then go into questions? I think it will complete um, the conversation or presentations. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, excuse me, Attorney Martinez, um, happy to have you here. Good to see you. You've been promoted. Uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Councilor Coletta, for holding this hearing. And thank you to my district councilor, Fernandez Anderson, for sponsoring this important ordinance, as well as all of your co sponsors. My name is Mark Martinez. Uh, in addition to being a Roxbury resident, I am also a housing attorney at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. Uh, one of my chief concerns in my job and of the MLRI housing unit as a whole is the availability of affordable housing, and in particular to people and families of color. Uh, I first want to start by echoing what so many others have said and thanking Chief Dillon, who I have the pleasure of working with uh, very frequently on a whole number of things, and who has always been a champion for affordable housing in the city of Boston. And also really happy to see Dr. Nina Estrella Luna testifying today. I was fortunate enough to serve on the Research Advisory Council for the Homes for Equity Project, and so I'm really happy that research has been, uh, been able to be highlighted today. Um, given what we've heard from uh, the other people that have testified today and the fact that I echo everything that has been said, I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief um, so we can get to questions. And what I'm going to focus my remarks on is what I know best as a lawyer, and that is the law. Uh, and so what I'm sure uh, if most, if not everyone on this call knows, is we have a federally mandated duty, right, handed down by the Fair Housing Act, not to just not discriminate, but to affirmatively further fair housing. And what that means is, as I said, that doesn't just mean that we can't discriminate. It means that we have to proactively take meaningful actions to overcome patterns of segregation, promote fair housing choice, eliminate disparities and opportunities, and foster an inclusive communities free from discrimination. And we simply can't ensure that we are fulfilling our duties under the FHA if we aren't collecting all the data that we need. And now I want to be clear, I'm not claiming that the city is not fulfilling its duty um, under the FHA or that they're not trying to. On the contrary, I think the city is trying very hard to meet its duty. And I simply want to point out that in order for the city to do that, in order for us to support the city in doing that, we have to have all the data available. And the other thing that I want to point out is that I know collecting the amount of data that we need is a laborious process, but we also don't have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of this stuff. HUD and other agencies produces most of, if not all of the data that we're looking for. And so we can look to them for a model. Um, they don't have maybe everything, but a lot of that 
is there. And so, you know, we don't have to, like I said, reinvent the wheel. Uh, to borrow from an old adage, you can't fix what you can't measure. And I know everybody on this call is really dedicated to fixing the problem that's been created by generations of racism and discriminatory, discriminatory housing policies. Um, and so I look forward to lending whatever expertise I do have to helping us get that, to helping us get to the point where we can measure what we need so we can go forward and fix this problem. Um, and so, like I said, I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks brief. Um, I am happy to answer any questions but um, I know that we are all on the same page here and um, you know, look forward to figuring out how we can do all of that great work together. Thank you so much for your work. Um, your presentation, Attorney Martinez, like I said, it's good to see you and happy you're here. Um, Counselor uh, Fernandez-Anderson, we'll go to you for, for questions. And I do just want to remind everybody that Dr. Estrella Luna has a hard uh, stop at 11 and she uh, excuse me, chief uh, by 11.30. Uh, well, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, uh, the floor is yours for any questions you may have. And then we'll go to Councilor Weber, Councilor Mejia, and Councilor Ruby Jen, if, she, if she's here. Um, I also see that Joanna Edwards has been promoted. Um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, would you like to have her uh, say a few words as well? Um, I think because we have only, um, if Joanna can wait. Uh, just to get questions out to uh, Dr. Strada Luna. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how. How do you feel about that? I, yeah, let's let's go forward with questions, and then we'll circle back to Joanna. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead, Joanna. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, bear with us. Um, uh, so uh, to to uh, MOH, I guess uh, just how uh, do you currently collect some of the data that is. Um, represented in this ordinance specifically? Um, and are there ways to improve the data collection process to make it easier to disaggregate it once it is collected? Um, to, to kind of echo what Perina was saying, none of this is easy. It is totally possible. Um, and so as an example, the, the mortgage data, the HIMDA data, uh, we looked at that data historically. We actually have the data sets going all the way back to 1980, I believe. And one of the challenges with that data set, and it's a similar challenge to what Karina has is, had presented, is that you know there's different data in different years, and there's a really difficult, well, it's a challenging process to kind of reconcile things that are either in different data sets or uh, where data definitions change over time. Um, I will say we've done it, uh, so it's not impossible. What I would say, uh, and as re reiterating the point earlier, you know, the ordinance requires a report in one year. That might be a little ambitious. Um, I mean, it took us uh, almost a year and a half to do our work. Uh, now, our work also incorporated uh, archival research, which was uh, about six months long, but it also involved things like um, digitizing historic records, and so. You might need, and I don't know if this goes into an ordinance or is it, it's just a you know an agreement, but what might need to happen in order to do this well and do this expeditiously is to contract out some of that data processing uh, to professional researchers or research organizations that have the data scientists and the, the folks who can do the magic with R that actually processes data more efficiently so that that can happen. Uh, Karina is also correct that a lot of this data does not um, doesn't have all the information that we want. So one of the things that I saw that was missing in the ordinance um, that I think is important is looking at immigration um, characteristics, right? If somebody is a foreign born person, because we do know that um, being an immigrant also is another risk for housing and security. HIMDA data does not include that particular characteristic, for example. And so the way that you end up having to look at that is by um, basically doing an eco what we call an ecological analysis of census data. So you look, for example, at where are the high concentrations of immigrants living in Boston. And the benefit of doing this kind of work in Boston is that Boston is a hyper-segregated place. So you can actually uh, make some pretty good estimates of people's experiences by different characteristics because we are so hyper-segregated. So 
it would end up do, looking a little bit like that, uh, which is why I think, um, you know, giving a little bit more time to be thoughtful and intentional and creative about how you manage the data uh, is, is going to be necessary for, in order to do this well enough to both get the information that you need to do the kinds of improvements that the uh, Office of Housing is trying to do, but also to, again, legally justify any targeted policy changes in the in the current legal environment that we live in. Now, what as thank you uh, um, as Mark is saying, however, we can do this. It's actually for, for housing in particular. It's legally possible. We just have to collect the right data to justify it. Thank you. Um, I, sh I should say that this is all timed. Um, although you have to leave, we only get about you know eight minutes or seven, Madam Chair. I, I leave it to you to tell me. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for that addition and in terms of like the intersectionalities of uh, immigrant um, possible home, home buyers and how that impacts their um, financial uh, or how, how they're uh, uh, Im impacted by other types of, you know, different uh, um, uh, fi financial uh, strains. And um, I wanted to go to uh, Chief Dillon to sort of um, just respond to what Dr. Um, Sarah Luna is saying so that we can sort of get to a middle ground here. So, and I am not a researcher, obviously, um, but um, I certainly, I, I very much share the commitment that we, that we need to collect the data in such a way that's very, very, very thoughtful um, and is really going to be, we, we set it up properly, especially on the home buying and the lottery information. I think some of our other programs, we have very good data. They could always probably be improved. And I'd love to you know, work with a subset of the city council to make sure that what we're collecting in our generally in our programs um, meets your, your needs to evaluate and our needs. But on the home buying, as Karina mentioned, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're, we're inheriting a very big, big apparatus from the BPDA and we've got different definitions We've got different ways that the data is coming in. And to really understand, I mean, I really love looking at historic data and whether how it changes over time and what the factors are that are, that are really uh, impacting. So I'd love to come up with the right construct of definitions and data collection and mechanism for doing that. Karina mentioned these lotteries are massive. There's thousands of people in them, right? There's just lots of data sets, lots of variables. So we do need to spend the time and the money. It's not going to be cheap to really do it, do it correctly. So um, I agree. It might take, it, it, and this one piece, it might take uh, a year at least or more. Um, but I, I really do want to do it with, with you all, including outside organizations that may really be able to help us think through um, how best to do it. Thanks, Chief. Um, definitely open to hopefully moving this into a working session where we're talking about uh, timelines and more, more realistically or more practically. Um, Mark and uh, Dr. Straluna, um, I guess, or even uh, Joanne, if you have a response to that in terms of there are some difficulties in collecting data and possibly uh, contracting out to a third party, um, figuring out um, currently like you know, the partner with any data firms that assist to collect an, um, analysis of data. So um, what what are your responses to that and what's your, been, been your experience? Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me on today. Um, I don't want to take up too much time as I know that you all have valuable information to contribute. Um, and as a real estate agent, um, my experience in data collection is very minimal as far as when, when we encounter clients who are um, starting the home buying process. I know as a real estate broker, you make it our due diligence when we're meeting clients who are starting the home buying phase to connect them with resources um, who are fair, who are um, knowledgeable about the, 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 the housing um, products that they're offering clients when it comes to financing, whether it's FHA, whether it's 
um, BHA or OnePlus Boston. I personally don't have much to contribute in terms of data collection because in the in the scope of our work, we are more boots on the ground when it comes to helping buyers um, search for homes. And um, we make it our duty as real estate agents to just educate ourselves on um, all of the resources available in the Boston, um, in the city of Boston, whether it's non-payment assistance or um, uh, or other valuable loan products within the city of Boston. So um, thank you for having me today. I'm here more so just to kind of listen and to um, help contribute to any um, any information that you all have to offer today. As a professional researcher, um, I highly recommend working with uh, maybe not just firms, but also um, professional researchers and data scientists who have experience working with uh, advocates in this area, uh, and either in issues of social equity uh, generally or in housing advocacy and housing generally, in large part because your, your large data firms, they may have the skills, but they don't necessarily have the understanding of um, the specifics issues, the specifics of Boston, the geography of the space, the history of the space. So I think that when you look for partners, you look for folks who are who have that not just the skill sets but also the knowledge uh, of the, this particular issue. Housing has a very uh, specific and unique legal civil rights. It's in a it's in a unique legal civil rights space relative to other civil rights issues, and I think that's also important. Um, you also want professional researchers that are not that are going to help you figure out the right statistics. So when you look at our reports, for example, we didn't just calculate percentages of things, right? We also calculated relative risk because that's actually what gives us the information about who actually is more or less likely to benefit from a program uh, or benefit from access or be burdened by something. Um, I do say, I mean, when if you if you're you're doing this, I'm assuming, or I think ideally, so that you have a foundation to continue monitoring over time, which would be one thing I would say to add to the ordinance, that this isn't just a one-time report, but this is something that is a regular report that has to happen. Um, monitoring those changes over time are also, I think, very important, both in the percentages, which are important, but also, and, and the gaps between different social groups but also how that changes over time. I do think working with professional researchers, though, would add to the capacity, um, because it, honestly, the Office of Housing is already underfunded, under-resourced, they're doing 40 bazillion things, and so bringing in other people with the expertise to add to the capacity, I think, would help this operate more effectively and more expeditiously. Thank you so much. Um, Attorney Martinez? Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to oh, add, right? My, ex my expertise is certainly not in data collection. Um, Dr. Estrella Luna, it, I, I'm going to let her, she's the expert here. Uh, I would ask her all of your questions on this part. <laughs> um, thank is you. it possible to add anything, Counselor? Sorry, um, Karina, sure. Oh, thank you so much. I just wanted to add that I think there, there are certain analytical challenges around, you know, the census data, the Humda data that Dr. Estrella Luna mentioned. Um, we do have, you know, robust analysts at MOH who I think um, can work either independently or certainly in collaboration with outside resource researchers to handle that analysis. I think the real challenge and the real um, time-taking effort is around our application data and the current way it's... Um, collected. I think that is um, very pressing to resolve to answer a lot of the key questions that are raised in this order um, in terms of who is accessing our affordable housing, um, the units, the financial assistance, and so forth, um, and, how, and what does racial equity look like in terms of that access. And currently, the way we're collecting that data is insufficient for the amount of data that's being collected and for the kind of um, intersectional analysis that's being asked for. Um, so I think that, you know, from my perspective, is one of the most pressing things that we need to address here. Um, and and I, I do think it will take time to address that issue um, and put systems in place that address that issue and allow us to collect the data even before we can analyze it. It's very doable. Um, you know, if we are intentional about it, 
and I would very much look forward to doing so. I think it's a, it's of paramount importance, um, but I think that is the real challenge for us to sink our teeth into um, as soon as possible. I, I, I guess I'm trying to go back to my original question in terms of like, how do, how do you currently um, collect the data and then as it's represented in this ordinance and then as, as well as like how is MOH thinking through the ways to improve the data? Obviously, you know, uh, in terms of investments, if there is a will, there's a way um, in terms, yes, it's expensive, but it's such a detriment to black and brown people, to um, our immigrant uh, of, of population as well, to Dr. Strata's point. And when, if something needs investment for us to change, for us to not actively or inactively, um, indirectly uh, be so systemically oppressive or racist, how do we uh, make sure that we invest in, in what ways are you thinking through the ways that we can improve the data um, collection? Because it's at this point, it, it looks like if we know that it's a detriment for uh, financial status and we cannot pass generational wealth and we, it keeps us impoverished and it keeps us marginalized, um, therefore, uh, pe black people uh, in impoverished die 22 year years sooner than our counterparts in Back Bay, from Roxbury to Back Bay. That's obviously a public health crisis. Obviously, people, this is a, a life and death thing. Um, and so I would say, again, incumbent upon the city to invest. So the, the a matter of making it the point about expensive I, is taken. Um, but yet, you know, when we're talking about public health crisis, when we look at all these studies, it's something that has to happen. Um, the conversation here then becomes, how do we do it? Not whether or not, or how expensive, or what, you know, how hard it's going to be, but how do we work together to make it happen? So, because I do have to uh, leave in five minutes for another meeting, um, I would offer this thought for, for the council and for the Office of Housing to, um, to think about. Uh, you have a boatload of data, it's messy, it's in all these different places, it needs to be brought together, um, ideally in one data set or at least in connected data sets that can be connected. Um, and then you have the processes that you need to change going forward. And so one thing that might need to be thought about is, uh, and this is what we had to do with him to data uh, in particular, is uh, one process, having one initiative or one set of work that is working on that historic data going back however far back it might be reasonable, that is just doing that. And maybe that gets contracted out because that's a data science you know, challenge. Right, and then you have the current work that I'm so happy to hear you talking about, which is, you know, making these current both application processes and experiences, but also the data that's collected through that, working on that as a as a separate process moving forward. And there needs to be that those two processes need to talk to each other, right? Because at some point they need to, to they need to be connected, but they may need to be two different processes in order to both understand where we are now so that we can start making policy choices and, and improvements to programs now, which clearly you all have been doing, but also that you're not waiting for um, to, you're not waiting to get your act together now to look at what's already been happening and identify uh, the things that are, that can be identified from historic experience. So, I, it's something to consider about the internal work with the fantastic analysts, especially the ones that have moved over from BPDA, because they do have actually really good technical skills, uh, figuring out either what's going to happen moving forward with a separate initiative, potentially contracted out, trying to resolve and connect all these disparate data sets and the messy data there, and then working together on connecting them over time. That might be the most efficient way so that you're not just dealing, you're not just dealing with symptoms of today's problems, but you're also moving forward uh, on both ends. Uh, so just something to consider that might need to happen. And just to reiterate, yeah, it will require resources. It absolutely require resources and it will require time to do well. Dr. Estrella Luna, thank you so much for uh giving us your time, your expertise. We are going to definitely be leaning into you. I hope that's okay, um, into your work um, as well so that we can uh, improve 
um, this ordinance, hopefully. And I just wanted to thank you before you left and um, wanted to uh, thank uh, Madam Chair for giving me um, some time to get my questions out to Dr. Estrella Luna and uh, yield my time to uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. See you later. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, I, at some point, I'm going to have to turn over the chair uh, to Vice Chair Weber. But I, before that, I, I wanted to uh, ask Karina and the chief. I, I was trying to take notes as you were giving your presentation about what you do track. And so I'm talking about location and type of affordable housing, applicants to lotteries, the based on unit, ethnicity, genders, buyers of income, restricted units, um, financial assistance provided to home buyers. Um, that full list, everything that you do track, uh, if you could provide that in written form, that would be great. And also what you are not able to report on, um, the applicants, the waiting time, the accept applicants, all of that, whatever you had mentioned, Karina, that would be useful um, to us. Yes, we're very happy to follow up with that in writing. Um, I, I can also speak directly to Councillor Fernandez Anderson's question around how we track thing, how we track this data, how we collect this data currently, and what we would recommend moving forwards um, in the very near future, if that's uh, still an outstanding question. You mean you can speak to it now or you can provide it in writing? Either. I'm happy to speak to it now if there's time. Yeah, if you can outline that for us, that would be great. And then really quick before uh, before I forget, you did mention that there were various city agencies that over oversee these different data systems and third party, um, third party entities that go from touring to buying and then uh, verifying eligibility. If you could provide, I don't know if it already exists, but an org chart from start to finish, uh, if, if that's possible. I would just like to see this full web and, and network of, of who, um, who oversees what, that would be useful for me. But if you'd like to um, expand on, on the question that was asked of Councilor Fernandez and you may do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, we can provide that. Um, so there, we're talking about different data sets here. Different data sets will answer different questions raised in this order. And as I mentioned before, I think the most challenging data is the data pertaining to our application process, application and lease up for our income restricted units. So I think we're on very solid ground around um, financial assistance being provided to home buyers, as Sheila mentioned, and some of the other data sets that we already spoke about that we already track, which I'll summarize in writing. Um, but I think around application and occupancy is some of the more challenging data. The way it's currently collected is um, through an online portal but essentially a different portal for every lottery. Um, and the way that data is received by us or by the leasing agents that we work with is an individual record. So every time an applicant applies to a unit, each applicant, each unit for each project spits out an individual, basically Excel sheet, an individual Excel sheet with some of the data that we're talking about. The Excel sheet has different fields it for each project, they're not always consistent. So it's very hard for them to speak to each other. Um, so that's that's the way that data is currently captured. Going forward, what we'd wanna do is establish a dedicated engagement between the Mayor's Office of Housing and do it, procure a technology vendor to scope and develop a new technology for collecting this data from our constituents and potentially some new software licensing so that we're not getting individual records that aren't reconcilable that will require manual reconciliation um, and then potentially there will likely need to be um, a, a hire um, or an ongoing support contract to maintain this new system. But I think the benefit of that approach is it establishes a process for our housing seekers that is much more accessible, much more navigatable and much more user friendly, It will, which will improve outcomes just in and of itself while also allowing us to collect the data we need to better understand whether additional shifts in processes and policies are required to result in better, more equitable outcomes for our BIPOC um, members of the community. Thank you for that, Karina. I, I wanna note that we've been joined by Councillor Worrell and Councillor uh, 
Council President Ruzi Lubijen. For now, I'm going to pass it over to Vice Chair Weber for his question, seeing that Councilor Flynn has left, and then uh, go in the order of arrival. Um, I apologize, everybody. I have to go to the East Boston High School graduation, so I'm going to pass it over to Vice Chair Weber. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, I I see. I I, I was going to defer to the uh, the original uh, sponsors. Um, I see Council uh, President Louis Jen is off. I don't know if Council Rurell wanted to jump in. Um, uh, if not, I I I have a couple questions. Um, I guess, uh, so uh, uh, Chief Dillon, um, just so my understanding is, so a reporting like this would, uh, I, I don't know if, if you, if what prior practices in terms of like engaging outside firms, do you contract? So in the past, and um, I'm trying to think if there's been any exceptions to this over the, over the recent years, in the past, uh, we we do have a small policy and research team made up of uh, Karina now is currently the director and two, three people that uh, work on both a lot of data collection, a lot of and a lot of reporting on on the data, and then those folks are also very much engaged in <clears throat> program design and and policies. So uh, we do have a small a small but pretty mighty team, and they are providing us, you know really good analysis on the intersection of race, our programs, outcomes uh, over time. Some of the reports are standard. We do them every year. But I think a very, an intentional report on race, housing and race, especially when we can, um, I don't want to say fix, but uh, certainly make the data collection and reporting um, on our lotteries, who's accessing, who's applying for, who's accessing the affordable housing that we're that we're helping produce is key to that. But I, we don't have right now one report that comes out on a, cer a certain time of year um, on race and housing. We have we have information on uh, demographics, of course, along with the BPDA's research team, and we've got a lot of data. And some of it we presented at the city council budget hearing on our programs and who's accessing them and, and how much and how successful they are. But we don't have a report that brings all of that together. So what I think it's I think we have to see whether or not that's something we can do in house, especially after we have the, the right support from do it or whether that's something that we may want to bring some, uh, you know, outside eyes on. Um, and then I, I guess. In, in in terms of uh, the data uh, discussed in the ordinance, you, do you have any sense of other city departments? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the doctor mentioned BPDA or, or, um, that 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 have data like this that you can pull from. Well, there's. I think we have to expand the conversation. And Karina, please correct me if you if you have anything to add or you think I'm wrong. But the the BHA. Uh, has has is collecting data, and I I'm not here to speak on it because I don't know enough. But they're doing, you know, they're renting up and providing resources to their to their tenants. The BPDA collects research, certainly. Um, there's the Fair Housing Office, right? So I do think it's part of this exercise. We're going to have to have conversations with other divisions to make sure we're not missing or making making sure that we're you know collaborating and bringing all that that data together because it's going to give us the most complete picture. Karina, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but. Well, I think, I think there, you know, there's some data around questions around like who is renting in Boston? What, what, is, what does the rental profile look like? How has it changed or how many more renters do we have? Same on the home ownership side, which was mentioned in the order. That's census data, that's HUMDA data. We have that, we can do that. We can certainly do that internally. Um, I think the challenge is around the data of pertaining to our affordable housing units and occupancy and the application, um, the entire soup to nuts application to occupancy process there. That's data that only is collected by us or by third party um, leasing agents that we work with. There's no other way to access that data. 
And as I mentioned before, that data is not in a format that's user-friendly, to say the least. Um, so I think if we corrected that, which we can certainly do with um, you know, investment, focus, commitment, and time, um, we can do the analysis in-house. The analysis itself is not that hard. It's a sophisticated and, and key analysis that should be done. But the real barrier here is around data collection um, so that we have the data in a format that allows for the analysis. Um, that said, I think Sheila is correct. We would, we would certainly be reaching out um, not only to different divisions in MOH who work on um, these programs and policies and collect the data currently to improve how it's collected, but also working with the BHA, um, which was a key um, partner in how the ordinance, you know, some of the questions raised in the ordinance. Okay, uh, and then I guess uh, uh, Chief, maybe Karina, Attorney Martinez wants to weigh in. That would be good. Uh, but just in terms of like what time span would be useful to have this data? I mean, it's, if it goes back to 1980, uh, you know, I would think we'd want to see trends. Uh, I'm just looking at the ordinance. You know, uh, I'm not sure. I I see a, the 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 time frame for reporting. Are we just looking from today forward? I, I don't think that I, I, I think it would be more productive to go back. How far do we want to go back? Obviously, we go if we make this so difficult and we're getting irrelevant data from 1975, what you know, um, I guess I'll start with you, Chief. What do you think would be uh, useful? So I think historical data is is always very, very important. It's illuminating. It tells us where we're going. I think if I was to prioritize, though, effort, right? And I was to say, what do we do first, second, third? Because we are spending now, because we have policies now that are impacting people, I would probably focus on going forward, making sure that we are reporting uh, sort of current data sets and impact and, and programs and outcomes of programs and then certainly start looking backwards. But I, I would focus on going forward first because we're spending money and we do our best looking at data. We're always looking at data to see what, where we should be spending our money and what programs should be like and, and looking at our policies. And we really do use the best data we have to do that. So I would focus there and then I would head back. But Karina or Mark, I don't know if you have anything. I, I would just add, I, I think, um, Dr. Estrella Luna has done some very good retrospective analysis that really tells us, um, you know, what the challenges certainly have been and perhaps continue to be. Um, and I think we, I think that's that's very rigorous, very strong, high quality analysis. If we're interested in historical trends, um, I think the real question. I hate to sound, to sound like a broken record, but I think the real question of this order is who are city programs and resources. Um, serving, who's accessing them, and what is their experience like in terms of accessing them. Um, and I think we can only do that going forward. We need to position ourselves to collect that data in a way that allows us to answer the questions that you all have raised going forward. And that, that I echo Sheila's comment, sorry, Chief Dillon's comment, that that's going to allow us to make more strategic decisions around policy and investment of resources. Yeah, I would just quickly um, echo all of that. I agree. You know, I think in an ideal world where we have all the money and all the time um, to do all of it, we do all of it. Um, but I think, right, there are just legitimate challenges collecting historic data, right? The ways in which race and ethnicity have been collected over time have consistently changed, which makes doing those kind of longer historical studies really difficult. Um, and also, you know, truth be told, I, I don't... Speaking for me, I don't know that we need another report to say that there's been a history of racial discrimination in housing in Boston, uh, right? I don't know that anyone needs any more convincing of that. And so I think that's been really well documented in lots of different ways. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, again, in a world in which we could do everything at the same time, sure, let's do it. But in a world in which we have to prioritize, um, I think starting from now to understand where we are at, because we already have a pretty strong understanding of where we've been. Um, you know, I think that's the best, uh, the top priority for moving forward. I, I agree. And I would also just add in terms of timeline, you know, I don't think we're talking about like three to five years here. I think we can position ourselves to do this analysis in a shorter timeline than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, 
since I'm, I've been handed the chair baton, I'm just, I'm going to pass it on. Uh, I, I, Councillor Flynn was in the order. Uh, he, I don't see him here. Councillor Mejia, uh, you know, I think um, yeah. we're just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll set it at six minutes. We'll see where we're at. Uh, thank you, there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be having this conversation with you all. Um, and I think uh, Mark is really uh, insightful with his uh, uh, description of the fact of the matter is that we already know what we know, and there's no need for us to go back and try to figure it out because the process has already been clearly laid out. And I think that there is an opportunity for us to utilize existing, existing data to um, to be able to uh, sorry, to be able to understand the benchmark of where we're, where we're starting from, right? And use that as just kind of like a, a benchmark that you're to be able to uh, track and and analyze the impact, right? In terms of moving forward, right? So I think that what has already been documented can help us set the stage. And then I'm more interested in kind of like what does success look like, right? And we know we have information, you know, what 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 are going to be the the met, the, met, the metrics that we're going to use to see how the city is doing to address this issue. And I'm just curious from I think is to gather the information when we don't we don't know what the information is and what's the framework to analyze and, and determine impact. And then what's the innovation behind it? So I'm curious, um, um, Karina, Karina, Sheila, if any of you have seen other cities or other, you know, other states, you know, kind of like what are some best practices and anything that you could share to inform our thinking and moving forward. Karina, do you want to mention of some of the other cities that you're sort of well, I, I would first mention that we, we do have some um, metrics and benchmarks already established for Boston on this subject. So the Boston Housing Strategy 2025 um, sets quantitative targets for us to work towards, which will guide policy decisions and investments. So, uh, for example, we're working to support 750 new homeowners um, by 2025. At least 65% of them will be BIPOC. Um, we're aiming to reduce annual eviction execution. But before you go there, please, I just want to make sure that you understand my question. Sometimes I need to try later, but I guess what I'm trying to understand is, you know, in regards to the specific code that we're in the workers that we're talking about, like what are some of the things that we need to do um, to get um, to track? I'm sorry, I'm having I'm having trouble hearing you. There's some um, breaking up or interference. I, I, I think you're asking about benchmarks and targets or metrics, but I'm not sure specifically if I was off track, uh, what what track you'd like me to be on. Yeah, can you guys hear me? You, can you guys hear me? You're breaking, breaking up. Yep, yeah, let me, let me, Thank you, Corinne, for trying to get to. I understand that the city already has benchmarks and metrics, and I appreciate that. The, the problem is, or at least what I have seen here, is, is that there was. I, I participated in the, one of the uh, breakout Hello. sessions that um, looked at the Yellow Knuckles in Bassbury, right? Um, and I, I'm curious about solutions here. So, if you could just share with me what game types for screen. I'm, I'm really sorry. I just the, the audio quality is not allowing me to understand the question. Okay, that's okay. I, I um, Councilor Weber, I'm going to log off and log back in. My time is probably up anyways because I've had so many issues with my internet. Um, yeah, it, uh, Councillor McGee, why why don't you just log back in? We'll go we'll go to someone else, and then uh, you can you know, I'll give you as much time as you need. Um, 
Uh, so just uh, Councillor uh, Council President Louis Jen, are you here? Um, okay. Yes, I'm here. I'm I'm yes. here. There, there you um, are. Okay. Thank you. And apologies, I was on um, right at the beginning. And then also had some audio issues and was, was multitasking. So, uh, but I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank my colleague, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, uh, for this really important filing. I've uh, been able to listen in um, at some of the questions, and I do believe that I've heard both Chief Dillon and Karina answer some questions about our current reporting um, and whether it be the fair housing, um, Office of Housing Stability, um, and other areas. Are there areas? where in housing, like in the reports that currently exist, are they all tracking uh, racial data? I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the so-called reports that we track or a lot of the data sources do track race and ethnicity um, data points. It's of course voluntary by the, um, you know, housing seeker. And so it's not, it's not a 100% cohesive data set, um, but it is a question asked. So if I, if I could, I think, you know, the vast majority of the programs are collecting uh, neighborhood and race data. Things like the student housing report comes to mind. And Karina, correct me if I'm wrong, there is not race data in the, in the student housing report. So there are some reports and some data sets that we collect and analyze that uh, do not have a, a sort of a, a race. We're not collecting race data and analyzing it. So there, but the vast majority of, <clears throat> and I think uh, it was a requested uh, Council Louis Jean that we send over um, all of the data sets that we are collecting, um, and we can, so we can we can certainly then uh, do that, like all the, the program, all the expenditures, uh, looking at whether we're collecting the data and analyzing it, and whether they have whether we're looking at race, and so we can itemize that. But there are a few that come to mind, like the student housing report, where that is not a that is not a factor. Yeah, but I oh, apologies. Apologies, I misunderstand. Uh, misunderstood the question for the reports that we issue um, that reflect our analysis of trends in Boston. Our home ownership for uh, our home ownership report, for example, looks at race. Um, when we look at things like rent burden um, and housing stability, we look at race. Um, it's true our student housing report does not because of data availability limitations. Um, that data is just isn't collected by institutions. And I what I what I do want to look at too. I know that we are. Um, through HMIS, not that we fund all of the shelter system in Boston, but through our HMIS data, looking at homeless populations, um, there is there are race fields there too. So I think that we just need to spend some time and just itemize for you and for us exactly what we're collecting and and um, what might not have what we all need and what we think you know what we need to do. But I, I, we can get that over to you in short order. I would, you, but summarize, sorry, I would summarize, though, the vast majority of our programs and data sets that we do collect do, do collect information on race and we do analyze it. Okay, um, I guess. Uh, I can't hear anything. Is my internet also good? Uh, yeah, we seem to be losing you. Uh, Oh, okay. I, I said my question is about the analysis that you do do. This is an ordinance that calls for enforcement. And um, I don't know if the analysis that you currently are doing leads to enforcement. I'm wondering how you're thinking about what enforcement could and should look like here. Um, sorry, maybe if I, I, I didn't, um, I don't, I think is it is the, I. Sorry, I think the ordinance is written in a way that, uh, or, or the hearing, the order is written in such a way that um, that there's an enforcement that the data will be collected and analyzed, right? So I don't think it's enforcement beyond that, but I, I may miss, I may be misunderstanding. 
Okay, and I'll, I'll also leave it for, to the chair to clarify that it's not any sort of external enforcement. It's just ensuring that our internal departments are doing the reporting um, that will allow for um, a deep for like equity analysis of affordable housing within the city. So um, I think those are my questions and I wanna thank uh, the maker and wanna thank the advocates and the administration uh, for being here. And thank you, um, Councillor Weber, Chair, for indulging sort of my um, uh, Zoom issues. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay, th thank you, Madam President. Uh, so uh, Councillor Mejia, if you, you want a minute. Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one minute, I heard Jesus. If, if, that, if that works. Uh, well, yeah. I didn't even get my full six minutes, Council Weber. But, but I, I appreciate the, the, the management here. Um, so I, I guess my questions were pretty much along the lines in terms of so I think something that we talk about metrics and affordability. I think one part is to have a tool the next thing is with the information that we get. And I'm just curious, Sheila, like in something like this, how would you use this as a way to potentially also look at developers and people who are building affordable or even ownership opportunities here in the city of Boston that are um, a little bit more sensitive towards equity, right? Like, are there some, some folks who Point to that state. Partners, Boston, bad actors. Because I think that all of this, right, and and just to be completely transparent, that all of these conversations, at the end of the day, we have to start thinking about these things as the city as a whole, and that means our business partners, that means the folks that we are providing funding for to do to build affordable home ownership. All of these tools. And that just needs to be a part of the conversation. If you have that data, great. And if you don't, it would be good to start thinking about how we can add that into this conversation. But just curious about your thoughts on that issue. I caught some of that, um, uh, Chair Weber. If I could try, I, you were still breaking up, but I, uh, I heard my name. Um, so we, I think your point is a very, it's not just looking at who's the recipient of our programs, it's also about how we're spending our resources and whether we're providing economic opportunity for uh, for businesses of color or our BIPOC businesses that are located in our neighborhoods. And, you know, as the this, this city, it's another department, has always uh, looked at construction hours, right? That was always the measure for a long time. And now, uh, development teams that are coming into the city or MOH looking for resources to build affordable housing. We're looking at ownership of those businesses. We're looking at the soft cost businesses. Who is the architects? Who are the, who are the uh, management companies? Who are, who's providing the 21 E's? Who's providing, right? So we're really expanding beyond just construction hours. So that too is a whole other area of data that we, uh, that we need to, that we're starting to be more um, more intentional about collecting who is benefiting economically from uh, uh, affordable housing production in the city. City of Boston is not alone. Uh, a lot of our, our lending partners, you know, MHIC comes to mind. Um, the state is looking at this as well. So the, the industry is starting to really look at this question about who's benefiting. And I, you know, and I think it's overdue. And I'm really happy that we're that we're really starting to be much more intentional about that. But as we chunk out the, all the research that needs to be collected and analyzed and and shared uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, I would also include that. So we are in agreement. We are in agreement there. Uh, and that's if I understood the question. Yeah, I know that I have. So, so yeah, Councillor Mejia, just because I it, I think it was a little difficult to hear the question. I is that does that answer your question? Uh, I, I'll, keep, I'll put you. I'll give you a little extra time if you know we haven't oh, addressed so, it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I think Sheila, you definitely understood my question um, because what I see here is oftentimes 
and I say this all the time, we are resource rich, but coordination poor. And when we're talking about any conversation around equity, we have to look at everyone who is benefiting um, from the construction um, all the way to who is gonna be able to afford to live in these homes. And so I really do uh, appreciate your answer and, and acknowledgement. And I think that Councillor Anderson is the queen of equity. And I really love that she's always censoring um, that word, even though sometimes it feels uncomfortable for some folks, but we, we, we need to be able to be courageous around what this moment is calling for, and we need to uh, make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable to that work. Um, so thank you, Councilor Weber. My internet isn't all that great, but I don't have anything else to say. I just want to thank the advocates, particularly Mark and Dr. Yamuna, for their fierce advocacy in the space of thank makers and the administration for your willingness and Okay, thank you, Councillor Mejia. Uh, Councillor Worrell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel for being here. Um, a lot of my questions have um, been answered or asked, um, but, but I do want to just say that I, I value data, and I think that data should be like our way and our driving principle or what we drive towards when we are, you know, taking up any initiative, especially one like housing. So I guess one of my questions, can the administration provide examples of uh, current zoning regulations or policies um, that, you know, we're looking to um, put in place to promote um, diverse uh, neighborhoods and stabilizations of communities in the city of Boston. I mean, one that comes to mind for me is, um, and I don't want to get the name wrong, but it's diversity preservation policy. Um, so sort of like a um, making sure that the diversity in that neighborhood um, is, you know, doesn't go below right, the, the threshold that it is at now. So uh, maybe it's how do we prioritize um, those in that neighborhood for the housing that we're building? So I'll, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we, we have had difficulty over the years with our, our HUD partners on giving neighborhood preference and um, other cities too have taken HUD on and, and lost. Um, but but I think I think it, it bears having another conversation with HUD around neighborhood preference, even if it's a certain percentage. I would love to be able to go out into a neighborhood and say uh, the homes that we're building or the homes that are being created or the opportunities that are here are gonna benefit a, at least a subset of the existing residents. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Fair housing has been, um, fair housing doesn't always agree with us, but I, I was just thinking the other day, I think it's worth having another conversation, especially as we continue to see displacement of uh, our, our BIPOC families from Boston. And I, I think it's really very much worth a conversation and it, it might be very, very helpful to have some of the city council engage in that conversation with HUD and others. So I can't say for sure we can do that. I mean, I would certainly, uh, I'd be taking it up with the administration if I felt like we could legally do that right now, or, or we do it with HUD and not lose funding. Um, but I'd be glad to explore it again. Yeah, Chief. Um, however, wherever you need me, yeah. I'm happy to be part of um, those conversations um, to make sure that we're doing everything to kind of make that possible. Um, the other thing that, you know, I... Uh, would we'll love to see, and I don't know if this is even possible or not, is that people are, are you know, I mean, Boston is not affordable, so people are buying elsewhere. Are we tracking mm. or trying to find out what people are buying to kind of influence what we're building, right? Um, you know, when I, when I meet with developers, they're like, oh, people want one bedrooms, but are people buying one bedrooms in Broughton and Randolph Right? It's like, is that the case? Um, and then when I, you know, read the RKG um, Associates report that was what they did that they did for um, the city of Boston on the IDP policy 
on, you know, they, they spoke specifically about um, the household size when it came to BIPOC families. And, you know, those sizes of families are, are usually um, you know, larger than, than yeah, the five plus households, right? So just kind of seeing like how we're not only informing our developers, right, on what we should be providing, uh, but also like any developer um, that's coming to the city of Boston on, because the inventory matters, right? Like if we're not building the inventory for the families, like that is another form of displacement, right? Like, so, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know Karina's staff have been really looking at the the IDP policy and bedroom si or, or unit sizes uh, and uh, bedroom sizes. I will say the um, the new IDP policy that when we put the IDP policy in zoning, we really thought a lot about um, our ability to not just require a certain percentage of units, but instead require a certain percentage of, of a, a certain percentage of square feet, right? Give us the raw square feet. And then we will work with the developer on, instead of saying, oh great, we get five one bedroom units, we'll instead say we get this much square footage and, and potentially um, in, create affordable, larger family size units. So um, I'm, I'm hoping the new IZ policy provides us a lot more flexibility. Karina, I don't know if you have anything, you, I know you've been thinking a lot about this, but if you want to, Add anything? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sounds like somebody else wants to add something. Um, yes, I, I think you know you're right. You're absolutely correct. Uh, I think inclusionary zoning and the you know calculation for compliance from bedroom mix to square footage will allow us to um, you know get more family sized units. I think also we're using the affirmatively furthering fair housing zoning to advance that objective as well. Um, so I think we, we do have some tools in place. I think understanding market trends and you know why why the market doesn't produce these things, which is essentially, you know, they're not as profitable, <laughs> um, is is something that folks have a clear understanding of and 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 therefore requires public um, policy and investment to address. Yeah, no, and thank you for that. Um, but also want to just make sure, like before, like there's, there's current construction and that we're pushing those current uh, developers who are coming to the city um, to try to push, you know, more family size housing on them as well, uh, because IDP, right? Like that's not the current, right? It's not the current policy in place now. So I just want to make sure that we're um, actively doing so as well. And no no further questions, Chair. Yeah. Councilor Orell, thank you. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that, that we've been joined by Councilor Sharon Durkin, uh, and we've also been uh, joining the panel uh, from Reclaim Roxbury is, is Danielle uh, Summer Kieta, Kieta, Kieta. Uh, and um, uh, I guess is uh, subbing in for Armani Armani White uh, from that organization. Uh, I guess we're, we're uh, um, Danielle. We're about to. Uh, Chief Dylan has a, a hand raised. One, one second. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, I just wanted to before you came on, Councilor Weber. I do need to leave for the Pine Street graduation. Uh, Karina can stay. My apologies. Um, so I'm going to have to sign off. But I'll catch up with Karina, and I've, I've made a list of everything to follow up on. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I guess, um, Danielle, since you're joining us late, uh, did you want to uh, say something? And then, uh, Councillor Durkin, you would be up next for questions. And, and I'm just, I'm trying to figure this out for everyone who's on, because, uh, so, uh, uh, real estate advisor, Joanne Edwards, Joanna, you're on here already. So we're not going to have a second panel um, because we'll have everyone on. Obviously, I think we, if anyone has any questions, we should go up to, to follow questions um, from those present. But Sharon, you, you'll be finishing up the first round after Danielle, uh, if, you, if you want to address the group. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, 
uh, and thank you for, for letting me uh, fill in. So my name is Danielle Summer Chieta. I'm actually, uh, I'm with Boston Tenant Coalition, but we, I partner very closely with Reclaim Roxbury and Armani White, and um, together our organizations um, are both members of the Coalition for a Truly Affordable Boston, which uh, is a network of many other housing advocacy groups um, who all uh, have a great interest in this. So I'm really glad that we are able to uh, address this today. Um, I am really glad to hear that we're looking to create, uh, to be able to capture more data about affordable housing and um, just who's able to access it. Uh, that's something that we are always um, advocating for and pushing for. Um, and I am going to, uh, because there's been a lot already said about this, I'm going to perhaps um, tailor my comments to sort of a context for why this is important. Um, we're all familiar um, with, or hopefully we're all familiar with the statistics that uh, that Councillor Anderson provided at the, at the start about the uh, just dramatic difference between black and brown home ownership and, and uh, white family home ownership, particularly in Boston. Um, and more recently, there has been a lot of uh, discussion about the need to build racial uh, wealth via home ownership and whether or not that is a uh, sustainable uh, system. And I would suggest, and, and particularly I think that the data will help bear this out, that um, in reality, income restricted or subsidized housing programs that are helping to protect affordability have a greater impact on the financial well-being of black and brown communities than uh, removing such deed restrictions. Um, deed restrictions we find help to stabilize speculation in communities. They help anchor people to community um, and as such are critical uh, pieces of uh, of stability for all. Um, they also prioritize um, the collective or community good rather than individual uh, financial benefit. So currently we have about 3,000 home ownership or deed restricted home ownership units across the city. It's like something about like 3%, I think, of home ownership. <laughs> um, that is not a significant percentage. So as we talk about the the need to build black wealth and support black wealth, we really need to think about it within that context of how, how much of an impact we are able to make. Um, and so I would suggest as we think about this data that as we look at deed restricted units and we also think about community land trusts of which the city certainly doesn't own, but there are several in the city, Chinatown uh, Community Land Trust, DSNI has one, there's the Greater Boston Community Land Trust as well. These are all, um, programs that allow home ownership, that um, give lower income folks access to home ownership, allow them to build a certain amount of equity and, uh, and have it be a stepping stone to, the, uh, to their own financial uh, well-being and stability, rather than allowing speculation. There's a lot of, um, we all want to believe that this, um, the American dream allows us to uh, believe that if you buy a home, then you will create that stepping stone. But in reality, for so many people, home ownership is not necessarily a financial st like stable stepping stone. And we can just look at the 2008 housing crisis as a clear marker of, of that kind of issue. Um, whereas by allowing deed restriction, by investing in that way, you are not, you're sort of shifting the point. The point is not about extracting a lot of money out of the house. The, uh, uh, it's about having a good place to live. It eliminates issues of fear of removal, um, any financial stability issues that folks have. Um, all of these are very important factors in, in um, deed restriction in, in that housing stability. Um, and it allows people to uh, save, invest in other needs they have, education, um, healthcare, should that be a, a, an issue, um, saving for retirement. Um, so we are always advocating for more housing, um, more affordability, more investment in, in deed restriction, more investment in community land trusts um, as a way of creating a more equitable and diverse Boston, and I will limit my comments there, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Uh, th thank you, Danielle. Um, I'm just going to uh, send it to Councillor Durkin, dog barking in the background. Um, you have uh, six minutes. Thank you, Chair Weber, um, and thank you so much, Danielle. Um, really great to uh, have you here. Um, I I have, um, and I've been at some events in the district, but I have had staff um, watching and really appreciate um, uh, Councillor Tanya Fernandez-Anderson for your leadership here. Um, I think um, it's clear that we do need more info and more data um, just to sort of describe some of these trends. Um, and, you know, what I've heard from leaders um, within housing is that there are, you know, additional, um, there are things historically that have impacted, um, particularly um, people of color being able to access home ownership, like, um, and I know that some of those were described here, like bad interest rates um, that have been given historically to, um, to communities of color. Um, but also, I think, you know, in today's climate, um, I have talked with a lot of advocates about uh, banning credit checks as, um, you know, something that we may um, try to explore. I'm just curious, Danielle, if, you know, I know um, this particular proposal is um, targeted at having more information and being able to shed a light on some of the issues, but are there other mechanisms? And I know the city and the administration have been working on home ownership and um, and what we're finding is that there isn't a lot of housing stock um, to and that's sort of one of the issues that I've you know heard over and over again. So just curious um, if you could describe some of the other um, you know I think this is important to shed a light on and for us to have the information. But if you can describe some of the other things that the city is doing to promote home ownership and communities of color and then also. Um, just describing some of the other issues that folks are running into when trying to purchase a home. And then I really appreciated uh, your comment too about home ownership not necessarily being, you know, with the interest rates as they are, um, a viable path for a lot of families right now. So just curious also your thoughts on that. Sure. Okay. Um. Mm. So uh, I think some of the some of the challenges in particular right now of housing and of particularly of meeting fair housing of which like of, of certainly affordability um, is a component, right? Um, is that uh, in so many ways we are relying on uh, private development to create a uh, city plan that really supports all of us. Um, that uh, there are many ways in which the city is sort of working towards that and moved towards that. I think one of the uh, clearest examples, I, I work on this every day, is um, the AFFH zoning amendment that, that the city has and the ways in which that um, shifts the focus, not just to the amount of affordability in, in um, housing being uh, proposed and developed, but also like looking at those other protected classes like families, like folks with disabilities, um, uh, and ensuring that we are creating housing for everyone. Um, but still, it is a challenge. And I think um, in some ways, uh, some of it is also like a, a public understanding issue, right? So we talk about affordability, and many people think of affordability, and they assume that you're talking about people who are um, very much like uh, sort of on the lower levels of the working class, like blue, very much blue collar. So they envision ideas of maybe like service workers, right? And they imagine affordable housing and they sort of uh, assume that that is the same as public housing. Now, public housing and those service workers are critical to our 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 cities, infrastructure, they are important and vital citizens and members of our communities, and there is literally nothing wrong with being in that kind of space. But that's not actually what affordable housing is. Um, right now, affordable housing means folks at like 70% AMI, and in the fall it will go down to like a, an average of 60% AMI. But that, those people, that's our middle class right now. Like, for context, it's like 
you know, almost all, like a large percentage, I, I forget who did the study, it might have even been the city of Boston, something like 80% of city employees qualify for affordable housing. Almost all teachers qualify for affordable housing. That's not who we think of when we say this, right? And so we really do need to think in a more strategic manner of how we do planning. Um, to ensure that we are creating more economic diversity throughout our city, uh, because these people are fundamental to um, all of the elements uh, that make a city run. Um, and then, I, and I hope I'm answering both parts of what you're, you're looking for. I think one other point I really think is important to uh, emphasize is that income restricted or subsidized housing is not the same of, as market housing, and that is on purpose uh, because equity is built um, in the home. It's based on a formula that spreads across the home and it benefits across multiple households and multiple generations. So housing payments are lower, costs are lower due to the, the subsidies, so your taxes are lower. Uh, for many people, home ownership sometimes is a stretch, and it takes very little to put you in a very tenuous position. It can be your boiler going out, that's like $15,000. Your roof, that's like 15 to, you know, can be more than $15,000. These are very small things that then cause this housing instability. Um, uh, so we want to have that uh, a more stable market that allows for people to build wealth essentially a little more conservatively without the speculation because that benefits everyone. Um, I hope I answered everything that you were asking. Yes, absolutely. And um, I know we could spend all day on just sort of that group of questions, but I also wanted to speak a, or to have a chance to talk a little bit because um, I think some of the things within um, the filing um, talk a little bit about like the speculative market and just how hard it is for, and I know the one Boston, you know, mortgage program has uh, been really helpful, but um, in terms of the ha like the actual housing stock that is available and also the LLCs sort of that are buying up, um, especially in neighborhoods like Fenway and um, Mission Hill in my district um, and Roxbury as well, um, the just sort of the speculative market um, and obviously institutions and how institutional um, location sort of drive some of some of these um i was just curious sort of what the city is doing to sort of stand in the gap um mm -hmm. and to make when housing is um up for grabs um and and how how we can leverage um city um resources to make sure that things continue to stay um or you know that that we're able to find um, stand in the gap between us and like, L, you know, and LLCs and other sort of more institutional buyers in our neighborhoods. Right. So I think, um, yeah, that is a, a, a sort of in some ways hidden issue that um, maybe is in more recent, I would say even in the last six months is starting to get more, um, more lights shined on it uh, because that is a component, right? Like land is one of those things that we're not really making more of, as people like to say, right? Um, and so as much as we want to build more housing, if we're also having groups that are, um, are really patterned on not just taking housing out of a market, but like and looking at it as a, um, like a private market investment. So not these personal, uh, like generational wealth building investment, but like a much larger um, issue. You, you start to uh, really speak to like um, a really a national <laughs> phenomenon that's, that's very problematic. I think um, that's something that, and maybe other folks from the city could also speak to this, that's something that is a particular challenge because there are concerns around um, um, who can own, right? Certainly deed-restricted housing, uh, one of the benefits of that is that uh, the individuals have to live in the home. Um, so particularly with home ownership, if you own a deed-restricted house, you you have to be residing in said house. Um, and that, that kind of 
eliminates in many ways that speculation. It can't be owned in the same way by like a private investment company. Um, uh, in terms of like the larger uh, market forces, um, I think Boston, um, there are, when I look at it nationally, uh, there are other areas that are really, really struggling with this in, in many ways. Um, uh, like places like Seattle and Phoenix come to mind immediately, also Atlanta. Um, but uh, it's, it's quieter here. It's a little bit smaller here. It's a little bit less like um, these sort of private investment firms and tends to be smaller real estate investment groups um, doing this. One of the challenges of an LLC is that because it's limited liability, it also sort of is private. It protects the, the um, interested parties. Um, those tend to be then transferred into like renters. It's sort of creating a permanent renting class of, of housing stock that we would have traditionally had on the market for home ownership and definitely uh, affects and puts a pressure on the market that helps to increase um, housing costs and, and speculation, um, which again, like when we, what we see is that as you're adding deed restriction, you sort of tamp that down because of that, that housing is not available for, or, uh, for that particular kind of use. Um, I don't know specifically uh, of ways in which the city has um, specific policies related to um, reducing that type of speculation. Um, I know that there is an interest uh, in really ensuring that, that people be able to get access to homes, that they be in homes, um, but I don't personally know of a specific policy um, that addresses that type of speculation. And again, maybe perhaps somebody else can can speak to that. Uh, Dan Danielle, thank you uh, uh, for that. Uh, Councillor Durkin, your, your your time is up. Um, I just, yeah. um, uh, I guess, I, I, I uh, Councillor Financial Anderson, uh, will start the second round. Uh, I I don't know if. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you five minutes. I don't know if anyone wants that has questions in the second round. So uh, we'll see, or if anyone else has any questions for a second round, raise your hand. Uh, but Councilor Fernandez Anderson, uh, back to you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to redirect us back to the actual ordinance that's on the floor uh, that, that we're discussing today. Um, I did file a hearing order for restricted deeds. This is not it. Um, we are discussing specifically just collecting inf information to prove um, the level of systemic racist practices um, so we can actually understand who has access, who doesn't, who's getting the opportunity, who's not, how are we discriminating against people, how long are people waiting in comparison to other people by demographics, um, and so forth and so on. So uh, we're trying to uh, have a conversation with the administration to be able to actually look at, if you've re, if you looked at data already, if you're collecting data, what does that look like? If you've contracted out, who are you contracting out with? How are you looking at improvement, improving um, those those uh, data collecting uh, practices? And uh, thank you so much, Karina. I looked at Boston um, Housing Strategy and. Um, absolutely, it, it looks gorgeous, it looks amazing, um, and I look forward to actually uh, digging deeper into it to understand like where we are with things like that. But specifically to data collection, um, this would actually uh, obligate you know, the administration. And then I've, I've heard in terms of with an obligation to start within a year, then is that timeline to um, you know, uh, constraining, and do we need more time? And all of that's open, right? Because this is a hearing, and we can discuss specifically how um, the, 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 the timing makes more sense or how uh, we can be more practical in our approach. Um, and so I really appreciate, Danielle, I just want to say thank you so much. It's always a pleasure seeing you. Um, I really appreciate the context behind it, because you're, you're right. Like, since we've already talked about data and all these other specifics, you want it to come from a context of look at all of the, these other impacts as it pertains to uh, restricted days or, as it, or, or home ownership and where uh, we have uh, marginalized communities, especially obviously in black and brown populations, 
um, what is the more immediate equitable solution? Absolutely, I'm with you 100%. I want it to be on record to specify, to, to, to be clear that um, I agree wholeheartedly with affordable rental options. Um, and then obviously looking at how the city can share the responsibility of spreading affordable housing, affordable rental, so that we are not condensely populating poverty in one concentrated area, so that we are uh, ensuring that we have a development that creates amenities, holistic amenities, to create housing systems. So we are improving our way of life. For example, like where you guys live, JP, I see a lot of JPers here. Um, a beautiful, walkable, you know, uh, transient type of environment that offers a lot of holistic amenities. Create uh, obviously invests in social determinants of health, as we know it, you know, from the Health Boston and other uh, other uh, backgrounds and expertise that we have. That it it uh, of course supports and um, our lifestyles and improves our. Um, quality of life in general. So I, I wanted to just sort of, you know, encapsulate those points to say everyone here, like amazing um, contributions to this conversation. And I'm looking for specifically uh, responses from the administration, Karina, in terms of like how you're collecting data, but not just what you're collecting. And then if you can't collect them, what is the reason? If it's legal, if it's specifically that's against the law or whatever it is, we need to understand that so that we are uh, restructuring or adding to this um, ordinance to ensure that our amendment obviously is practical and makes sense. Um, and I think for, I just wanted to share, I just wanted to uh, review uh, here. I, I think for my questions, a, uh, a lot of the different, um, a lot of the questions that my colleagues were answering added to the conversation, enhanced the conversation. Um, I wanted to thank my colleagues for coming in. And if I if I have, um, I, I do have a final remark after this in terms of uh, next steps, but I wanted to stop here if I have an additional uh, one question, maybe um, coming back and just closing us out. Um, but I, I think this was a really co good conversation. I think we're going into the, a, a real good direction in terms of this ordinance. Um, and I hope that my colleagues feel the same. And I'm going to ask uh, the, ch the chair and you, vice chair, if we could hold a working session or maybe a meeting with the administration to be able to look at how we can actually workshop the ordinance um, together to, to make more sense out of it or to improve it. Um, that, that is all for my point uh, for now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and just uh, in, in looking at the ordinance, uh, you know, I, I I I feel like it's it's definitely sorry. Uh, um, you know, it's it, it it's 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 nearly perfect, but just uh, maybe some minor tweaks. I was you know, if, if some people were not acting good good faith. Technically, they'd be. I think they would be in compliance with it by providing one week of the number of applicants, you know, in these things. So I, I do feel like defining the what, what we're looking for for the past year or whatever might just help, uh, and it, and might help the administration, you know, I focus them in the in the in the places where we really need the data. And I'm 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 learning through the, through these hearings, you know, what. what what those metrics are, and, and and so thank you for filing. I think we a working session would be good. Um, uh, uh, so I just I I before your final uh, comment, I just I, I wanted to see if there was public testimony or would uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, do you want to make that comment before? I I, I don't want to. Uh, if you're okay with public testimony first. I do want to uh, thank the um, uh, attorney Martinez and uh, Danielle, um, and instead of making my final points here, asking them if they had a final um, point before we go to public testimony. Yeah, that that would be fine. My uh, my understanding is that there is no public testimony oh. uh, being requested. That may may change, but. Uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, give the panelists. You know, if you want, uh, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to cut you off in two minutes. Uh, but uh, 
uh, if you want to give a final thought. That, Apologies, know. Mr. Chair. Uh, also, Joanna is still here. She had a final comment as well. Yeah, uh, correct. Yeah, jo I mean, Joanna, you're a panelist. Uh, we would love to hear if you have a, a comment. If you don't, no, we're not, you know, going to uh, you know, give you a bad grade or anything. Thank you for participating. Anybody who who, who wants to make a final comment, uh, two minutes each, I guess. Uh, I guess I'll start. Yeah, I mean, Karina, I, I'm just assuming you don't have a final comment, but if um, I, I, I'll just say that we would be very happy to have a meeting or a working session to dive into the details of how we actually um, can position ourselves to produce a really robust report on this subject. Thank you. Okay, uh, Attorney Martinez. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, you know, again, happy to continue to lend any expertise or knowledge that I have. My only real parting thought is this. I think obviously this entire hearing is about data, and I think data is really important to understand where we are. Um, but I always like to give this warning in conversations around data is we can't let the absence of data um, prevent us from acting, um, right? We can't let data take the place of uh, people's real lived experience. Um, and so I think data is really important in figuring out what the solution is. And I think data is really important in kind of tailoring our response to really specific things. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying anyone is suggesting this. I'm not saying anyone's suggesting like we pause until we have this data, but I always like to be really clear that the data often um, just kind of backs up what we know because we can talk to people and people have lived this. Um, you know, this is not new. Discrimination is not new. Um, it's not an old thing. Uh, I mean, it is a very old thing. Um, and so as we move forward, you know, I think this data is going to be really important to really fully understand where we are. But, um, you know, let's not use data to replace the, the stories and the lived experiences of the people in these communities, in particular Black people in Boston, um, because, you know, they have st stories to share and we shouldn't be waiting for data to validate those. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, Joanna Edwards. Hi, I have no further comments uh, moving forward. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no, thank you for participating. Uh, and yeah, again, you don't have to make final comment, but if you want to, there's an opportunity. Uh, uh, Danielle. Um, thank you again. I just want to reiterate uh, that I do think the data is very important. It's something that um, all sides really use to help understand um, how best to move forward. And I look forward to having not just the data, but a uh, clear understanding of how said data will impact policy moving forward. So thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor, did you want to make a final statement? Um, I, I I just last call for public testimony. I I don't think there there has been Ron. Uh, I just want to triple check. Um, I don't think that the yep. No one has signed up, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, um, okay, uh, Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson, if you want to uh, make a comment, and then we'll close the hearing. Thank you um, so much. Uh, once again, I wanted to express my gratitude to you, Mr. Chair, and uh, gratitude to the panelists, to administration and advocates. Um, Danielle, uh, an invitation beforehand to come back to uh, to come to join our hearing for uh, restricted deeds. Um, would love to learn uh, from you uh, in that conversation. Um, I think what we learned here uh, learned is that collecting the data is possible. Um, we just need to be intentional about uh, the resources and staffing potential to realize this effort. Um, we learned a lot about uh, the current uh, data collection practices. And I think that this is exciting because it addresses two issues at, um, at once. Um, the data that we need to collect and the way that we need to go about collecting it. Um, in summary of, a summary of some of the recommendations that I would say, um, creating language that compels the appropriate agency to create new processes that make it easier to collect this data in the first place. Uh, we don't want to add any undue burden um, on the administration, but we can all agree that this data is valuable and, need, and needed um, for policy. Um, so thinking critically about who uh, does this data aggregation or uh, analysis, 
Um, some of this can be absolute, can absolutely be done in house, but maybe some of it needs to be done by outside contractors. Um, find ways either through ordinance or through budgetary alignments um, to encourage more collaboration between MOH, BPDA, Fair Housing, and Do It. Um, is what I heard a lot here today, express uh, also to explore the intersections of race and income, intersections of uh, race and ethnicity, uh, disaggregate certain ethnic uh, subgroups and incorporate um, immigration characteristics and census data. Um, also consider the timeline of how often the administration must produce this data um, to better uh, respect the work that uh, goes into it. Um, this is doable, um, it's important, and we can, we have the capacity to make this happen. Um, and with the support from advocates and administration alike, we can make a substantial impact um, in ensuring that black and brown residents can be placed um, into permanent long-term home ownership opportunities. But also, um, obviously we heard here as well about uh, you know, uh, starting with affordability is the most accessible and is proven to support uh, families in their uh, immediate circumstances. Um, so thank you again to the panelists, to everyone, to my co-sponsors um, and uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, and of course, to my colleagues for attending. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Um... Just, you know, I, I want to thank my colleagues and the lead sponsor, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, for joining this hearing today, as well as our panelists. Uh, this matter, you know, will, will uh, likely remain in committee for a working session. Uh, this is this hearing on docket number uh, 0471 is adjourned. I'm looking for an object in my house that could substitute as a gavel. I have a small baseball bat. Yes, it's a Mets bat. I will be rooting for the Celtics uh, with all my heart and soul tonight, but, uh, you know, that's uh, the end of this meeting. Thank you.